um, or their sexuality, whatever that might be. Thank you, Sir George. Thank you, Sir George. The petition we debated today seeks reform of the Gender Recognition Act to enable transgender people to self-identify into a new legal sex without the need for a medical diagnosis or proof of treatment. In other words, the petition seeks to allow those who have been born male to become legally female or vice versa, without any requirement to undergo changes to their hormones or their anatomy or under medical guidance. Now let me be clear, be clear, no trans person should face discrimination and I have nothing but compassion for those who continue to be harassed or abused or stigmatised. Adults should be free to dress and present as they wish without fear and it is up to all of us to stand up for the dignity and respect of everyone, including trans people. But what is being requested by this petition is not a minor, minor amendment to an existing law or a demand for trans people to have equal rights, which they do have under UK law and rights that should be, always be upheld by all of us. Rather, the demands of this petition seek what I would be, do believe, and I'm afraid I do disagree with my honourable friend here, would be a fundamental change to the law. Because society, the law and science all testify that we as individuals can never fully define ourselves. Rather, our identity comes from a variety of external factors that we can't change, however much we may want to. The country of our birth, who our parents are, the colour of our skin, whether or not we have children. None of these physical realities can be altered by our internal thoughts or feelings, however strongly they're held. The reality, the truth, is that individual identities are complex and multidimensional, but they are as much a function of the things we cannot change as they are of the things we can. And of course the same goes for sex. Because let's be clear, human beings, like all other mammals, cannot change sex. At the moment of conception, when sperm cell fuses with egg cell, apart from rare abnormalities, there are two possible outcomes. I certainly will. And I recognise the point that she's making in that people often think that we have male and female. But the truth is that 1% to 2% of the global population is born intersex, which means they represent, uh, present characteristics of both sexes. But to put that in a perspective, 1% to 2% of the population are ginger. So is she telling me that she doesn't believe in ginger people? <laughs> I thank the Honourable Lady for intervention. And I do understand uh, the point that she's making, which is why I said that there are these rare abnormalities. But I think... Well, it, uh, intersex... Uh, I have to say that people who are intersex should absolutely be treated with compassion, with every medical treatment that they deserve from the moment of birth, but that is a different thing to saying that someone who is born male can choose to be female or vice versa, which is why I've said that that is a rare, rarely the case. Normally, the choice at conception or the determination at conception is either male or female, and that's, that is the biological, the genetic uh, fact. So at this moment of conception, this new cell, now I'll, I'll make some progress, the new cell, the unique human being, the zygote, is the blueprint for every single other cell in the person's body. The zygote divides, it divides again and it divides again until there are trillions of cells making up a complete human being. These cells have different functions, muscle cells, nerve cells, blood cells, but every single one of the 37 trillion cells in an adult human has the same genetic code including the same sex chromosomes. Um, I will. There are people who have different sets of DNA within their genetics. I think it's just simplifying the science here, and it's actually much more complicated than she wants to. And I know she's got a genetics degree, but I've got a biomedical science degree, so I hope we can do that. And make that I happen. thank the Honourable Lady uh, for giving way. And I, I, as I said, I absolutely recognise that there are rare genetic abnormalities, and I am simplifying, and I am talking about the majority. But I do understand that this debate is actually not about people with genetic abnormalities. It's about people who are identifying as a different gender to their birth sex. They are two very different things, and I am talking about uh, the latter. I know I will make some progress. So, we do, so every cell in the adult human body has the same genetic code. However much an individual may want to change sex by undergoing surgery, hormone treatment, or changing their lifestyle, it's just not scientifically possible to change our sex because it is written in every single cell. Sex is immutable. And not only is it, is it immutable, our sex also determines and influences a large part of our identity as people. Our biology, our psychology, our life choices, 
whether we can become a mother or a father, and also what diseases we may suffer from. These are established and proven scientific facts, not a matter of individual beliefs or feelings, however strongly they may be held, and I absolutely accept that they are held strongly. So, to allow somebody easily to change their sex in law would be to accept as a society that this material reality is not important or can easily be changed in a straightforward way. And I don't believe that that is a wise route to take. And it would have wide-ranging repercussions in other aspects of law. Yes. Uh, for giving away, just for a point of clarity, what she seems to be suggesting in this section of her speech is that gender recognition and change shouldn't be part of our law currently? Have I misunderstood what she's saying? I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention, and I will come on to that. I believe what we currently have is, is a good compromise, and I'll explain why I think that. Um, so I don't believe this is a wise route to, uh, a wise route to take in, in, a, in the broad picture, but I also think there are some specific impacts of GRA reform that would also be significant, for example, threatening sex-based rights. There are sound reasons of privacy, safety and dignity for women's requirement for single-sex spaces and services. When using changing rooms and sleeping accommodation or in prison, women and girls have a right to expect that there are no males also using those spaces. Self-ID could threaten these sex-based rights, and I agree with, my, with the Honourable Member that we are awaiting guidance on that, uh, and it could row back on decades of progress towards women's equality. I'm curious to know whether the Honourable Member supports the current GRA and GRC because, because what she's talking about in prisons already exists. People can have a GRC, but they are not automatically put in the estate that the GRC... They're not automatically put in the estate, and I can give you numerous examples. They are put in depending on an assessment by the prison uh, authorities. What's wrong with the current situation where the prison authorities make an assessment regardless of the GRC? Uh, I thank the Honourable Member for his intervention. I think there's a lot wrong, wrong with what's going on in prisons at the moment, uh, but I do think that's beyond the scope of the debate. And as I said to the, um, the Honourable Lady, I, I will come on to why I think that the current law we have is a, is a good compromise. Um, so self-ID could threaten these sex-based rights and row back on, on a lot of progress in terms of women's equality, but also the effect on children would be hugely damaging. We are already seeing a situation in schools and online where vulnerable young people, often girls, often same-sex attracted, often autistic, are being told that the answer to their problems is to change sex. This is manifesting in a concerning rise in girls who are not only identifying as trans or non-binary, but are going on to make serious and permanent changes to their bodies that will result in lifelong medical, sexual and psychological problems. Yes, I will give way. As a scientist, does the Honourable Member accept that hormone therapy isn't permanent? The whole point of it is to pause puberty in order to give a child space yeah. to, to make decisions and to explore their gender identity. Uh, I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention. I don't accept that um, uh, pausing puberty has no repercussions, but it's also the case that 98% of those who are prescribed hormone blockers or puberty blockers go on to cross-sex hormones. That is, the, that is the reality of what is happening at the moment with a 5,000% increase in the number of girls referred to the... I certainly will. Giving way, she'll be aware that at present Sir Hillary, Sir, uh, Hillary Cass has been uh, tasked by the UK government with looking at the reasons why there has been such a huge increase in the number of particularly young girls uh, seeking puberty blockers and uh, surgical treatment. Does she agree with me that we would be wise to wait for the outcomes of that review before taking a final uh, view on whether or not we should support self-ID? I, I, I... Of course anyone's entitled to make an intervention and the speaker is entitled to take them. I would just warn those who are on the list, however, that their chances of being called would be, will be reduced by the amount of time they spent on interventions. So I, I'm not trying to dissuade anyone from intervening, but I think they need to realise that it may jeopardise their own chances of making the speeches that they came prepared to do. Miriam Kate. George, and I, I thank the Honourable Lady for her intervention, and I entirely agree we must wait for the outcome of this very, very important uh, review. So if we did reform the GRA in this way, it would send a signal to children that society accepts that it is true that one can change sex 
Uh, and I don't think we should be misleading our children in this way. So I can't support the calls for reform of the GRA outlined in this, in this petition. But I do want to say one final word about compassion, because I have no doubt that those who are calling for this change are doing so for reasons of compassion. Western culture has come to define compassion as giving an individual what they need in order to alleviate suffering. Now, of course, there's a strong argument for this, and we all as individuals have a responsibility to alleviate individual suffering wherever we can. But as legislators, we have to balance the best interests of society as a whole with the interests of individuals, and here there must always be compromise. The government's position on the GRA therefore represents a sensible compromise. It is possible for trans people to obtain a legal recognition through a GRC subject to appropriate medical checks and balances. This upholds the rights and dignity of trans individuals, but it also protects the social, legal and scientific understanding of sex that is vital to the functioning of human society.